Hi everyone and welcome to my develop session. My name is Callie and for the next half an hour or so I'm going to be talking about inclusion in the games industry. So we haven't got that much time so it's just going to be a high level introduction to the business case for more inclusive um, businesses and also some of the challenges and solutions that we may face when building more inclusive organisations. So uh, before we get started let me introduce myself. For those of you that don't know me, I am HR and Facilities Manager at Payload Studios. We make a game called TerraTech and we also run the Tentacle Zone, which you may have come across. As part of my role for about the last 18 months or so, I've also been involved in Payload's inclusion and diversity initiative called Game One. So that involves lots of internal steps, but also our series of events which are always focused on inclusion and open to the wider games industry. So this is something that I've been learning a lot about for the last uh, year and a half or so. And it's also a bit of a passion of mine. So I'm not a consultant, uh, you know, I, I'm not an expert, but I have learned a lot over the last uh, few months. So I wanted to share some of that and hopefully it will be useful to some of you. Before we get into the talk proper, a little bit more about me. So I play a lot of tag rugby. Um, I'm a captain of copper teams in London. I'm a lifelong supporter of Liverpool Football Club. I also enjoy baking and uh, crafting. Been doing a lot of gardening since COVID hit. Um, I actually grew up in Tasmania, which is pretty much as far as you can get from, from the UK, uh, which is part of Australia. But my mum's family was originally from Estonia. I have been known to do uh, extreme sports, although not very well, but I did a lot of skateboarding when I was younger, surfing, paddleboarding, snowboarding, all of that stuff. Um, I also love to travel and uh, reading and photography. And more recently, I've been spending a lot of time playing Animal Crossing. Probably too much time, actually. Uh, now, you may wonder why I'm sharing all of this, um, but I guess uh, the point that I'm trying to demonstrate is that we are all more than our job titles and we are all more than our industry credentials, or more than our, our backgrounds, whether that be gender or race or sexuality, neurodiversity, socioeconomic background. You know, we're all individuals, and I think it's really important to remember that when talking about inclusion. Um, I think sometimes it's helpful to use categories to identify people, but we should always remember that there are individuals behind those categories, and not everyone's experience will be, uh, you know, in line with the average or, or what we perceive as the norm. So that's just something to bear in mind as we as we continue on. Uh, the other point I'd like to make before we start is that there is, um, uh, you know, I, I feel that inclusion and diversity sometimes get used interchangeably. Uh, you know, you often hear about um, d and you know, a, a, as one thing, they're kind of placed under the same umbrella. Um, but one of our speakers at our events recently expressed his concern uh, that this was the case because actually it can be quite um, it can be quite unhealthy to just focus on diversity if you're not also considering inclusion so the risk of that is that you diversify your studio or your organization and you get all this amazing talent in but because inclusiveness doesn't run through your workplace or your policies um, you don't actually retain that talent that you've managed to attract so I think the end game should always be inclusion and you can have inclusion uh, and that should bring diversity, but you can actually have diversity without having inclusion. So I, I hope that makes sense. But I just wanted to flag that uh, before we move on, because I think sometimes the two terms are used interchangeably. But I think it's really important to remember that the, the end game should be should be inclusion. So if I had more time, I would dig into the business case a little bit more, uh, but hopefully this, this slide demonstrates some of the key studies and, and stats that I've found um, that demonstrate the business case for diversity and, and more inclusive businesses. There's loads of studies on the internet, so if you are interested, I would I would advise you to, to go and check some of these out. Um, I have kind of tried to uh, mention where they've come from in, in some of these cases, um, but I think the focus should really be on, the, on those last two points. So the second Second last point is actually from a book called Diversify, which is written by June Sarpong and came out a couple of years ago. And it really, um, the, the, the last chapter focuses on some really interesting stats about the cost of not actively investing in diversity and, and not actually looking to in, um, improve inclusivity across our society. Um, and it, it's, it's a really interesting read. So if you're interested in, in, in stats and, and finance, I suggest you go and, go and have a look at that. Um, and the last point is really just there to demonstrate that there is a really strong moral case 
for more inclusive um, organizations and, and for diversity and you know, it's really about uh, giving everyone the right to go to work and, and be their authentic selves and to be valued and, and appreciated and respected and to have the same opportunities as, as everyone else in the company. So regardless of, of what your background is or what you might look like, you know, everyone should be treated equally. And I think that there hopefully aren't many people that, that disagree with with the fact that that should that should be how things are but it's a little bit more uh, difficult to ensure that actually um, you know everyone is treated fairly and that they feel included more than anything it should be that the moral uh, the moral case uh, that, that should be driving change in our in our businesses I think so there are a couple of key reasons why I think inclusion and diversity are particularly important to the games industry. Uh, because of time, I'm just going to whiz through these, but hopefully, hopefully you'll get the idea. Uh, the first one is that we're actually behind, um, you know, some other industries. And we know this because at the beginning of the year, Yuki launched their census. Uh, it showed us some really interesting things. Uh, first time that we really had um you know large scale data about who actually makes up our industry so if you haven't read it i would encourage you to, to go and download it and, and have a look uh and, and see what insights can be gleaned from it um but if i just pick out one example it, it the the census suggested that the 28 percent of the um industry is is female uh, but when you compare that to the working population, just under 50% of the working population are, are women. So there's a little bit of a discord there. It doesn't quite, uh, you know, it doesn't quite add up, uh, you know, when, you, when you're looking at representation and, and the actual people that are working. And there's such a huge discrepancy that it does suggest that there's something else going on. The second point is that we don't always reflect uh, we don't always reflect our players uh, I, and I think I wish I could talk more about representation because I, I feel like it's such an important important subject. The third point is is um, uh, you know that, that we are we are a young industry and, and we're growing you know we're growing rapidly and we're going from strength to strength but to to be able to sustain this we're going to need to attract the best talent and we're only going to be able to do that if we are inclusive and if we do become more inclusive than we are at the moment. The, the rate of growth and success that we've had, that's not sustainable for, for the future if we don't change if we don't change things now. So in the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you might face uh, trying to improve the inclusivity of your studio or organization, or as an individual trying to trying to be more um, inclusive on, a, on an individual level. So the first challenge I want to talk about is recruitment. And something that we heard quite a lot when we were, we were running our um, Game On events at the beginning was people saying things like, we want diversity, but we don't get the applications. There's nothing more we can do. The talent just doesn't exist, things like that. Um, and so I think it's really important to know that uh, there are lots of things that you can do. There's lots of actionable steps to be taken, but also that it is a long process. So, you know, it, it's, it, there's no quick fix, you know, as I said before. So it will take time to see, to see you know, um, a broader range of applications come in. But, it, but if you, uh, there's lots that you can do to, to encourage those applications. So this list is not exhaustive uh, and I wish I had a little bit more time to, to dig into it a little bit deeper, uh, but I'm just going to highlight, uh, highlight some of the stuff. So uh, I think the first point is really important just to research and learn. Um, there's so many more resources than, the, than there was a year ago or a year and a half ago. There's loads on, on diversity in general uh, that can be found, particularly if you're working um, you know, in the area of HR. There's, there's loads and loads of of um, free events online, of, of hubs and, and articles written on, on various um, HR websites. But there are also um, you know, some organizations working specifically with the games industry that could help. Um, so Yuki have their Raise the Game pledge, which is open to non-members as well. So you don't have to be a mem member of Yuki to take part. Um, but they have they have a, a blog and, and, and events and um, you know, all kinds of resources that can be utilized uh, and hopefully provide inspiration for, you know, if you're starting off it or on your journey, so to speak. Um, other organizations such as Putting the Gene to Gaming or Balance Patch, you know, work specifically in the games industry to help studios and companies come up with a plan that suits them. 
Um, and so I think the key takeaway is really that there's lots to be done if you just put in a little bit of, of research and you're open to learning about um, what we can do. Some of it is quite simple, like checking your job specs for gendered language, um, removing the a, a desirable criteria, uh, you know, looking at where ads uh, for your jobs are posted, looking at the recruiters that you're using, you know, are they committed to, to inclusion and diversity? Can they bring you, uh, you know, a, a variety of applications? Um, and things, uh, you know, some of it is, is, is a little bit more complicated, maybe, you know, assessing what your website looks like from the outside. Is it representative, representative of the diversity within your studios? And if you don't have that diversity, are you stating explicitly, are, are, are you, um, you know, making it clear that you value diversity and that you are committed to, to providing an inclusive workspace? And I think it's really important to note that you shouldn't be afraid of making, making those statements, even if you don't have, have um, you know, great diversity. You know, a lot of us that work in smaller studios maybe don't have the best diversity ever, um, but it's really important to show that you're taking steps to improve that and, and that you're really committed to providing a truly inclusive workplace as well. Um, lots of other things, so looking at, um, at how flexible you can be in terms of remote working, obviously something that we've all had experience of this year, but also there's lots of benefits to people that maybe have um, you know, caring, caring responsibilities or, or conditions that, that maybe mean that they prefer to work from home. Um, there's lots that can be done around around benefits around actively looking for applications from underrepresented groups as well you know partnering with with organizations or with groups and also holding events um you know whether that's something that you organize yourself or maybe you can sponsor events uh you know that are focused on inclusion and diversity and it's a good way to get your name out there especially if you are a smaller company or a smaller studio and maybe you know you're not a household name and you want to kind of highlight um uh, you know your company and the roles that you have to a certain to a certain audience or a certain group then events can be a good way to do that um and then i guess before we move on just worth noting that there there is a lot you can do um but you can do what you can and accept that it's a journey and it's a process and, and it's, everything's not going to suddenly change overnight. But I think, uh, you know, it's really important to also understand that there is lots that can be done and there are lots of resources and places that you can go to learn about, uh, you know, what, what actionable steps that can be taken. But there is always lots that can be done on the recruitment front. So challenge number two, overcoming unconscious bias. Um, OK, this is going to become a bit of a theme, but I do wish I had more time to talk about this one as well. Um, and so for those of you that, that aren't aware of, of what it is, um, you know, it's something that we all have uh, and there's lots of different, uh, you know, types of unconscious bias. Um, uh, you know, if, if you're interested, Google it, it will come up with uh, hundreds of them. Um, but, but it is something that we all have. Uh, and the reason that we have it is, is, well, part of the reason that we have it is because the majority of our cognitive activity, so I, I think it's about 95%, is actually unconscious um, and, and the reason for that is that we have to process you know a huge amount of data we have to make huge amounts of decisions on a daily basis and so our brains kind of figured out ways to, to, to take shortcuts essentially um, what that means though is that a lot of the time when we make decisions they're not actually based on facts or evidence but they're based on um, gut feelings and, and that sometimes can be can be really unhelpful um, and it can have a massive impact on decision making so um, Solutions, uh, you know, the first thing I think is really to just accept that it's part of being human. You know, it doesn't make you bad to have unconscious bias. We all have it in some form or another. Um, but there are also things that we can do to help manage it. So that includes things like educating yourself a little bit about what it is, about the impact that it can have, you know, if, if on an individual level. Um, but also if you are in maybe a senior position or a management position, thinking about educating your team and your employees as well. Um, and, th and there's lots of training that you can do now or workshops that can help people understand a little bit more about it and, and help ensure that it doesn't um, you know, mean that we're making unhelpful decisions about people. Um, and that ties in with, with the third point there about holding yourselves uh, and others accountable. So it's about understanding the decisions that we're making and making sure that they're, they're being made for the right reasons. And there's lots of other things that you can do to, to mitigate the impact. Um, so in terms of recruitment, as mentioned in the last slide, you know, you can get more people involved in that and that will potentially um, help counteract any, any unconscious bias. You can have, uh, you know, uh, codes of conduct or protocols for meetings to ensure that everyone uh, gets, an, gets an input. Um, 
and also we should challenge the assumptions that we make about people we should challenge um you know the conclusions that we're coming to and, and make sure that we're coming to them for the right reasons um so that is really a whirlwind introduction to unconscious bias hopefully it, it made some sense um and again uh you know i think the key takeaway is really that there is a it, you know it's an area that we need to learn more about uh, and it but it is an area that we can do a lot to, to manage as well so challenge number three is workplace culture and providing support and this is a really big topic so again this is just going to be a short introduction to some of the challenges that we might face on this front and also some of the things that we should be thinking about when we're looking to improve our, our organizations and our studios um, so the first thing to note is that inclusion should really be embedded into everything that we do. So that includes our policies, it includes, you know, the day-to-day -day running of the company, as well as things like recruitment and, and progression, uh, you know, for your teams. Um, the, the second thing to note is that there will sometimes be specific challenges faced by underrepresented groups. So that could be things like um, hypervisibility, you know, microaggressions, um, feeling feeling isolated, feeling lonely, and, and it's really um, helpful, I think, to try and understand these challenges and, and see if they are actually, um, uh, you know, part of how your company runs or if they're, um, you know, something that, that your employees are experiencing. And that really ties in with the third point there around, um, you know, are your employees supported? And these aren't just employees from underrepresented uh, groups or, or, or minority groups. It, it's, it's really about are your employees as a whole supported? Um, and, and it's really important to note that there's always more than c that can be done, uh, you know, regardless of how much you're already doing. There's already, uh, you know, more things that you can be thinking about. Um, so solutions, uh, as I already mentioned, you know, it's really important to learn about the challenges, um, you know, so for example, for me, you know, I can talk about my experience of a woman working in the games industry or in the creative in industries. But um, I know from talking to colleagues and, and friends and family that I've had, you know, I've had certain privileges, I've, I've had a certain experience that may not be actually what, what everyone else, uh, you know, experiences and, and um, it's worth learning you know, about those different experiences, about those different challenges that people face. And that kind of ties in with education. So educating yourself, but also educating your teams if you're in a position to do so, or, or educating your companies, you know, if, if you're a company leader. Um, and if you don't actually have, uh, you know, amazing diversity within your own teams, you can get in speakers or, or talk to people outside of your, your organisation to, to learn a little bit more about this stuff. Um, the third point is to talk to your employees and, and to, um, you know, ask them how they find working at their company and any of the challenges that they face. Uh, and so even if you're in a line management position, you know, you can do it for, for your teams uh, right up to, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a CEO or a company leader. Um, and one thing that we've found quite useful is providing people with a method to provide anonymous feedback. Uh, and again, it can be it can be really scary to do because uh, chances are it's not all going to be positive. But I feel that, that it's um, you know it's much more important to understand issues if there are any rather than not hear about them at all. Um, you know, obviously sometimes it can be difficult to deal with those if, if the, the feedback is anonymous. But it's much better to um, you know get that in the first place than to not hear about it at all. The fourth point there, uh, empowering your your teams. Um, one way to do this is with employee resource groups. I think there's a few different names for these, but basically uh, the idea is is that people that, that have a, a shared experience or shared characteristic kind of come together and um, they have the opportunity to discuss and, and, and learn and, and feedback to the company um, a, a, about uh, you know changes that maybe need to take place or challenges that they've faced and um, that's that's uh you know that's really important to note that this should not be happening in their own time so i think sometimes there is an expectation that that people will be involved in uh, employee resource groups or uh, planning for special events or planning for inclusion or, or diversity events and that they should do that in their lunch times or they should fit it in uh, you know uh, around their other responsibilities or do it in the evenings or in, in, in their own time but it's really really important that if you're asking someone to do something for the benefit of the company that that should be you know that should be within work time and that there should be uh, time made for that carved out for that if you like um, 
other things other things to note again this is not an exhaustive list but just some stuff that i've come across um uh, you know it's it's useful to evaluate uh you know reporting processes and to ask yourself you know is there a robust way for people to report a problem if there is one is there is there a, a you know a way that people will feel safe you know talking about any issues that do come up um and the last one uh you know support your teams is is kind of something that's tied into everything that that we have spoken about in this section um but particularly important i think for our industry because the UK census showed that there's a, you know, there is a high rate of anxiety and, and stress and depression within the games industry. So even, you know, even if you uh, kind of don't take into account the, the extra challenges that underrepresented groups may face, you know, as, as a whole, the industry, uh, I think, can do more to support people, uh, you know, in terms of, of mental health. Uh, and, and this can be done in, in a huge variety of ways. Again, there's lots of resources on the internet if it is an area that, that you want to work on but there's there's things that can be done for low cost as well so again if you're a small studio you know maybe you don't have the budget for healthcare maybe you don't have the budget for therapy there, there are other things solutions you can look at like employee assistance programs uh, like setting up you know well-being channels like training you know training a few people to be mental health first aiders which i would really highly recommend if, if anyone hasn't done that uh, you know i, I think there's something that, that i found really valuable uh, and that has been utilized quite a lot so i would really recommend that people look at that um, and then of course there's there's just actually talking about uh, mental health and and making sure that that's included in any sick leave policies making sure that people are aware of the fact that it's okay to, to talk about it within within um you know the workplace and uh lead by example as well if you can if, if you are in a in a leadership um you know position the impact of uh, maybe sharing your own experience or acknowledging that it's a challenge that that most people face you know at some point in their lives it, that can be really valuable to your teams as well so challenge number four is uh diversifying content and oh my goodness this is this is a this is another another big topic um so um yes so it's, it's kind of tied into representation in, in games. And I think, uh, you know, representation is a really important issue. I think it's often undervalued. Um, it, it's, it's, for me, really important because it shapes the way that, that we see ourselves. It shapes the way that we, we see our world. And it can have such a massive impact on us. And as people who, who create, uh, you know, content to be consumed by, sometimes by, you know, millions and millions and millions of people, it's really uh, important that we acknowledge our responsibility to make sure that that's done in a responsible way and then part of that is is i i believe you know diversifying the content that we do currently have so um i'm not an expert in this area it's, it's something that that i'm still uh you know learning learning a lot about but some of the things i have come across uh, you know things to consider is that it's much easier to think about inclusion from the beginning of a project so if you are in planning or early development stages uh, really really useful I think to kind of build it into your project from the beginning um, I think it's also important to challenge yourselves uh, and and others um, uh, you know and, and have a culture where people can say actually you know I, I find that a little bit um, you know problematic or you know that makes me uncomfortable can we can we discuss it uh, and make sure that 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 people understand that it's okay to do that um, I think another thing to, to think about is involving others in the development process. So um, I saw a talk recently from an uh, Australian uh, studio who are making a, a game in collaboration with the uh, local indigenous population. Um, and, and they had the saying that they used, which was nothing ab about us without us, which I thought was quite nice in summing up a healthy way for, uh, you know, to, to develop a game in terms of representation. So it's the idea that, um, you know, if you're making a certain character or you're making certain content that is specific to uh, a background or, or a life experience, that, you know, it's probably a good idea to have someone involved in that process. You know, even if it's as a consultant, uh, uh, you know, or as a, as a play tester, you know, people involved in that in that process that can feedback to maybe any any problematic areas or that can, um, you know, offer advice in terms of representation. Um, and that really ties in with 
you know, trying to overcome uh, stereotypes and, and, and tropes, you know, I think sometimes, uh, you know, games, as, as with most media, you know, there are shortcuts that are taken, which falls into the trap of, you know, perpetuating stereotypes and, and just doing something because it's been done before. And the last point, I think, is the most important one. And, uh, you know, it's about listening to your staff. And, and if someone says, uh, or listening to your teams, and if someone says, uh, you know, could we try it this way, or this this isn't great, you know, because of X, Y, Z, or this makes me uncomfortable, is to make sure that they're listened to. And equally, if you are, uh, you know, someone who's not not in a leadership position or not in a management position, um, having the confidence to, to speak up and share those concerns, I think, is really important. Okay, this is the last challenge. So thank you. Thank you for sticking with me and, and for listening to me uh, this far in. We're, we're almost done. Um, but challenge uh, five is more about the future. It's about pipeline, uh, mentorship and training. So um, the challenge is, 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 you know, the, the fact that our industry needs to change uh, from the ground up. And what I mean uh, uh, by that is, is kind of the pipeline. So right from education through to recruitment, through to retention. Um, and so, you know, we need to be questioning what can we do to to attract, uh, support and retain underrepresented groups? And how can we ensure that the next generation generation is more inclusive? Uh, so again, lots that can be done. Uh, I think, you know, especially if you're a smaller company, work experience and interns can, can be utilized really well to support underrepresented talent. Um, so it's it, the, the idea uh, of providing, uh, you know, certain groups with, with, with a leg up basically, or, or just with access to connections or experience that maybe they wouldn't necessarily have, uh, you know, because of the because of their background or because of, of, of the background that they're coming from. Um, outreach, I think, is really important to change the perception of the industry to show that that you know uh, it is a, it is an inclusive place or should be an inclusive place, and and to highlight uh, you know different different um, talents to inspire hopefully the next generation. Pipeline is a really big one, um, and I'm sure you could do a, a talk entirely on on pipeline. Um, but the need for internships and apprenticeships, and if you're in a position to be able to uh, offer those, then they can they again can be really really useful and really important in in offering an alternative way into the industry. Which means that you can get to uh, uh, you know candidates or, or talent that maybe you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And the last one I think is is a, events which is which has come up before, um, but it's a good way to uh, showcase uh, you know your your company, um, but also to you know reach people that you wouldn't necessarily reach, uh, particularly uh, you know if you're partnering with schools or educational institutions uh, in in that sense. So we're almost we're almost at the end. Um, I know uh, that was that was a whirlwind uh, trip through some, some of what I've been learning about in the last 18 months, but I hope I hope that it was helpful uh, and, it, and it provided you with some food for thought. Um, in terms of, of key takeaways, I think if you could take away a couple of things, um, these are the four things that I would I would want you to take away. Uh, one, just acknowledging that, that improving um, the industry and, and ensuring that we continue to, to uh, grow and positively change, it's very much a journey and, and, and it will take time. And, and, and that's OK, because, uh, you know, it's definitely something that's that's worth investing that time and that effort in. Um, the second one, uh, you know, change is coming. I, I can 100 percent say that, uh, you know, from from running these events in the last year and a half, there has been a really noticeable increase in interest, uh, you know, in the area. There's been a noticeable increase in schemes that are running in initiatives. Um, but the change is not coming quick enough. Uh, so, so what I think we need to ask ourselves is, do we want to be at the forefront of this positive change or do we just want to get swept, uh, swept up uh, along with it? Because, because it is going to happen, um, but we can all, all take responsibility for helping it to happen uh, quicker, which, which is only a good thing. And, and that's really the, you know, ties in with point, point three, which is everyone is responsible. And um, hopefully I've, I've demonstrated that there's, there's things that can be done. On, on both individual and, and on company levels to learn about some of these issues, to take responsibility for, for learning about experiences that may, maybe we don't have um, and, and to learn about the actionable steps that, that can be taken to improve inclusion uh, you know, within the industry. And the fourth one is just that there is always improvements to be made uh, and inclusion, you know, becoming more inclusive will benefit everyone. 
So regardless of your company size, regardless of where you are on your on your inclusion journey, regardless of how much work in this area you've always already done, there is always, always, always something more that can be done, you know, if, if you're willing to find it. Um, so that's that's about it. That that's that's me done. Um thank you so much for, for listening to me and, and for joining my session. Um I'm always happy to chat chat about inclusion. Um so if you if you want to talk you can find me in the usual places on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um or if you just want to say hi then then that's fine too. Um but yeah thank you thank you for joining the session and um stay safe.